Welcome to another inspiring message from Victory Church. We believe that God is at work right now to bring victory to your life. For more information about Victory Church, find us online at www.victorychurchnwa.com. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name. Bless your name, Lord. Bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Comes from you. Basically, over the last year and a half to two years, I have fasted a particular thing in my life because I just, uh, frankly, my blood pressure can't stand some of the things that I see when it comes to news that goes on around our world. But obviously, it doesn't make any difference whether I watch it by means of TV or not. There is this thing that happens where people talk, people think I should know everything about what's going on, and the next thing you know that starts happening with it is I begin to find out about all the things that are going on in our world. The thing that I want you to know today is regardless of what our world is saying today, I know where the center is. Are you with me? Now, I know that there are people that think we're crazy because we believe that way. I know that there are those who have the idea that we have this false reason for why we believe and why we do the things that we do. But I am as sure as sure can be that there is a God who is in control of my life and, and your lives in this room today and he's there with you to help you through your stuff. When the devil wants to jump in the center and bring a fight, let him jump in the center to bring a fight because my Lord will jump in the center with me and he will help me in my situation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's in the center of what we do. Of my joy. Oh, all that's good and perfect.
cup at the house. I don't use it so much anymore, but it's still my favorite cup. It's a, I've, I've got this thing for cups, period, but I've got a lot of Starbucks cups, not because I really think Starbucks coffee is the greatest coffee in the world. It's not because of that necessarily, but, but I just like their cups. I think they're cool. And they make them tall size for people like me that like to drink big cups of coffee. But I've got this one cup that's a Starbucks cup that's got a chip out of it. Now, I've got tons of cups, lots of cups, more cups than I need to have, no doubt about it. I don't have to keep that cup. I don't have to. I, I get emotional about it. Because I look at that cup with that chip out in it and other people would say, throw it in the trash. I don't. That cup is as important to me today as it was when it was whole. And when I look at that cup, everybody else looks at it and say, sees the chip. What I see is I can turn it around the other way and drink from the other side. It just doesn't bother me. I believe that when God looks at us, in fact, one of the things that happened was some of the girls in the house brought that, their, their plates home. And when they brought their plates home, there was pieces missing out of it uh, that they was unable to find or something. I don't know why, but the pieces were missing. And you know what? Those pieces missing out of their plate made the plate more beautiful than the fact if everything was exactly in place. The unique thing about it is when God looks at you, He doesn't leave, uh, look at you with parts missing. He looks at you and sees you as the whole person that He is personally making you. It doesn't make any difference who we are. Every one of us have imperfections in our life. Any perfect people in the house this morning? I didn't think so. But what we have in this house today is a lot of people with chips, bruises, all kinds of junk happening in your life that makes it look as if your life is... is not perfect but I see shattered but he sees whole I see broken but you see
one of the places that it talks about it. When we start looking at the end of time, what are those signs? Well, some of the signs was there was going to be famines and earthquakes, pestilence. Uh, my, my personal opinion is this, that the pestilence, one of the pestilence that's come is COVID in all of its different forms. 
And I believe that these particular things are, however you want to look at them, I believe that they were sent by the devil to try and stop the progress of the church and the world and to kill people. I don't know where it came from. I don't know how it was contrived, if it was a natural thing or if it was a manufactured thing. That's not my place to even try and figure out. I'm telling you it's a pestilence that has caused much problems in our earth. It's hurt our congregation. We've lost people that have died to COVID. And I am mad at the devil over this particular thing. Now, one of the things that we're facing around the world is we're facing massive famine. We have several people in our church that are from other nations of the world, especially African nations. And those particular African nations, some of those nations now are facing a complete financial collapse and economic collapse, and along with it, they're facing a collapse when it comes to food. Right now, one particular nation that I know of, two particular nations that I know of, uh, their, their, their relationship of their money to our dollar, it now what was, for instance, 10 of their dollars to one of our dollars is now 20. When you start thinking about that, what actually has happened is, in, in other words, their money is worth 50% less than what it was worth. So when you start thinking about inflation, that's inflation, folks. Now, here's the big problem with it. We say, well, they just their economy and their country is different than ours. Uh, no, it's not, because most of the, of the actual uh, smaller countries, the fruits, the vegetables, the things that they use to sustain them in life, they have to bring it. Many of them come from, uh, it comes from the United States or maybe from Australia or some other nations in the world that comes to them so that they have food on their table. One young lady that we know of in one particular country a few weeks ago, drove two hours to find a few bottles of water. That is critical. When I start seeing all the things that's happening, I see the war that's going on in the Ukraine, I see both sides and the fighting and all the stuff that's going on. This is what I want to say to you today. It is not just about the United States. We have this thing that the only thing we want to think about is us and what's going on with us. I'm going to tell you something this morning. Our world is broken. Our world is in a mess. Our world is sick. And there must be something that can happen that transforms this whole thing. I have no intentions of being political with you this morning or saying anything that away. If that's what you're, you want me to do, go find another place because I'm not going to do that. That's not my thing. What I am going to say to you today that is in the United States of America, we have become a major broken nation. We are broken in every facet that you look at. We're broken politically. We are broken uh, economically. We are broken socially. And can I tell you something? We are broken spiritually. What we've done is we have allowed ourselves to become so involved in the issues and some of you need to get off of Facebook and stop looking at all the junk you look at. You say, I got too much time on my hands. I just go there because I'm bored. Come out with me. I'll get you out of bored. Because I can find you something to do that will keep you out of that kind of mess. Because you see, what we do is it brings us into brokenness. Are you with me? 
You know, uh, if, if you stay around people that want to talk about it long enough, you can have enough people come up and call you ugly till pretty soon you're going to think you are. You're going to have people come up to you and say, you're sick, man, don't you look sick. And you're feeling good until after a while they just keep telling you, you, you look sick. Maybe I am. Maybe I need to check my temperature. Next thing you know, you're going to Walgreens to get something to make you feel better. When you you wasn't in bad shape in the first place. But what we do is if we talk about it long enough, experience it long enough that way, the next thing you know, it changes our attitude. And when our attitude becomes changed, all of a sudden, we who were possibly whole are not whole anymore. Because of the influence that's around us. So my word to you today is stop looking at everything else and go to the Word. Go to the Word. Allow the Word of God to become alive inside of your life. Now this is what happens in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7. They had just finished the building of the temple. Solomon had completed the work. Monies had been given. All had been accrued, uh, prepared uh, for, uh, for the building of the temple under his father David. And they build this wonderful, wonderful temple. And when they get it finished, this is what happens. Solomon begins to pray to God. And he says, God, this is what I want from this temple. I want that this temple will be a place that people can pray to and know when they pray to this temple that there will be something significant happen in their lives. That whatever their problem is, whatever their need is, they can just pray toward this temple and know that you are going to hear their prayer. So what happens in, in Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 12, then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I've heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And when I shut up heaven and there is no rain, that's called drought, and command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. What I was talking about just a few moments ago. Look at the next verse. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. Now, do you believe that? Yeah. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Next verse, Michael. I, I want you to see this. This is an important verse. My eyes will be open. And my ears will be attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. Here is something unique. Daniel, later on in the scripture, is one of those that was taken captive by the Babylonians. And I'm going to talk about that more in a moment. He was taken captive by the Babylonians, taken down to Babylon, away from his homeland. And when he gets there, in order to cause unrest and to get rid of Israelites who are there, what they, they did to Nebuchadnezzar, they told him, later on Belshazzar and others told them, Daniel prays every day toward that temple. Every day he prays toward that temple. In fact, three times a day, Daniel would pray toward that temple. That temple was hundreds of miles away from him, but he prayed toward that temple every day. Because of him praying toward that temple, they had him seized, locked up, thrown in a den with lions, 
And you know what he did in the den with lions? He prayed toward that temple. Now, how did he know what direction to turn that would be that way down in that den of lions? I don't really think it was the direction of his face that made any difference. It was the direction of his heart. So he prayed. He prayed. King shows up the next morning after he's been in the den with the lions all night. And when he shows up the next morning, they open it up. And the king, who had no rest that night, because he was worried that God's man was going to be dead because of the lions, his hair probably didn't look too good. His robe was probably not on straight. He didn't look quite as kingly as he had looked a few days before. But he walks up to that den. They roll away the, the opening there to that den. And he hollers inside and says, Oh, Daniel, are you okay? This is Kaufman's paraphrased version. <laughs> and he said, Oh, King! Leo became my pillow. And they laid down just the rest of the bunch just in the right way. And I slept well. How about you? Kaufman's paraphrase version. But God took care of him. You know why? Because God's eyes were open and his ears were attentive unto the prayer that was made in and toward that place. Next verse, Michael. I think it may have one more verse there. For I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. There's more to that whole story and, and, uh, that I don't have time to talk to you about this morning. I want to go back to verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then I'll hear and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and I will do what? Heal their land. Heal their land. We need healing. We need healing. We need healing. There's got to be something that transforms our situation. I wrote some things down, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read through them because I... If I don't do this, I start preaching, I don't talk about some of these things. And, and it was things that God gave me that I feel are important for you to hear this morning. We live in the most envied nation of the world. But we still have people who are broken and need healing that only God can give. The United States of America is becoming a product of our brokenness. We're broken in body, soul, and spirit. We're broken personally. Our homes are broken. Our families are broken. We have broken friendships. The workplace is becoming broken. We're becoming broken socially and politically. Can I say this? And even in the church, we're broken. We're split. Denominationally, we're split. And along with it, we are broken biblically. Do I have to get into that and tell you about that brokenness? Because we have a world that's broken. When I start looking at all of this brokenness, it causes me to understand some of the things that I see today. We have bitterness and hatred that has divided our nation and turned us into haters murderers, thieves, racist, and immoralist. We are broken physically, mentally, and spiritually. We have medical doctors, we have psychologists, we have psychiatrists using every means at their disposal to right our wrongs and heal our brokenness yet we're still messed up. 
When I began to think about this, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit began to speak to me about Israel. From the time that this 2 Chronicles 7 happens to the time that Christ comes on the scene is several centuries. But involved in this, these centuries, what you actually find happening is you could call it apostasy if you think about it from, from our day to day. But what you'll find is you're going to find from the time of David and Solomon's beginning, you're going to find that all of a sudden Israel becomes, first of all, divided because Judah was divided off, Judah and Benjamin those two tribes divided off from the others, and you have the actually the, the nation of Judah, and you have the nation of Israel. And you have two kings that come into, a, into play after Solomon. So first of all, they become divided. Then the next thing that happens in this division, you'll find that they also came to the place that no one uh, was completely holding on to the right truths and beliefs about God. And all of a sudden, other things began to filter in to their belief structure. You know what I'm talking about. A baby was born. A baby? Yeah. You're going to call his name Jesus. He's the Savior. Because he's going to save the people from their sin. He's going to transform the situation. So... The Savior is born. The Savior is born, and this is what happens. Luke chapter 4. After 30 years of being raised in his foster father, Joseph's carpenter shop, the day comes that he leaves the carpenter shop, goes down in chapter 3 of Luke, and is baptized by John in the river Jordan. And while he's being baptized, the heavens opens up, Holy Spirit descends out of heaven, a dove on his head, and a voice out of heaven said, This is my son, in whom I am well pleased. All that in place. He finishes it up. He leaves there. He goes into a desert place, and he fasts for 40 days and nights. And he has the devil come and tempt him, and he wins over the temptation. When he gets to the end of the temptation, he walks out of that desert place. He goes to the city where he grew up, and he walks into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And when he gets into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, it says, as his custom was, they brought to him the book of Isaiah. And when he gets the book of Isaiah in his hand. He found the place where it was written. Listen to this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken heart. Proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. What happened? You see, the start of your brokenness starts in your heart. If the devil can ever get you broken in your heart to the place that you do not see yourself or who you really are, then he's got you where he wants you. I could really get close and I could get finite in what I'm getting ready to say. I'm just going to say that our world is filled with people that because of their brokenness, they have allowed themselves to become something that they really didn't want to become. Something that they personally really abhorred anywhere else, but they became it because of their brokenness because the devil told them they were no good. They would never amount to anything. So go ahead and do whatever you do. It really doesn't make any difference. So they become broken. Broken in their heart makes them broken. But the wonderful thing, when Jesus showed up, 
He showed up to heal their brokenness. It's just not healing a broken heart. It's brokenness spirit. Everything that goes on in your life, He's come to heal it. Now, I've said all of those things to bring you to this final point. The church must become the solution, not the problem. Are you with me? The church must become the solution, not the problem. We don't need to add to the brokenness. It's our job to change it, to transform it, and let people know that God doesn't want them to stay in their brokenness. He's restoring me piece by piece. That process that God is taking us through, He's doing it in His church. He wants His church to become the true body of Christ. What would Jesus have done if he was here. Let's look. Mark 6. He called the twelve to himself. And began to send them out. Two by two. He gave them power over unclean spirits. He commanded them to take nothing for the journey. Except a staff. No bag. No bread. No copper in their money belts but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He also said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place, and whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So they went out and preached that the people should repent. What's the church here for today? Do you think it's any different today than it was then? Do you believe that the same God that was real at that time, that was saying to them to do that, do you believe that he's saying the same thing to us today? I believe so. How can our world have a major change? What's going to cause the change to come? This is my feeling. With this, frankly, I started to say, with this and $5 you can get coffee. No, this is too valuable. In fact, it's, it's more valuable than your home. It's more valuable than your cards. It's more valuable than money that you have at the bank. This is what you need to know today. This is what people need. They need to touch Jesus. If our world's going to change, if there's going to be any change, if there's going to be healing of the brokenness, if there's going to be any transformation come, I don't know. I don't, you, you may say, Pastor, you're just out there. You're so emotional. You just get into this stuff. I guess so. Maybe I am. But I really believe with all my heart the answer to our world today is not in the next president or the next senator or who's going to have a particular office somewhere. I believe our answer is when people can touch Jesus. And you see, this house must be a place where people can come and touch Jesus and their brokenness will be healed. Are you with me? Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. If all we're going to do is just play church, goodness gracious, 
I don't have time. I just don't have time. But I'll tell you what I want to see. I want to see people's brokenness healed. And I know I can't heal their brokenness. I know I can't transform them. I know that the words that I say are not intellectual enough and powerful enough. And, and I can't spin the right kind of thing that causes it to happen. The only thing that I know that can change it is when people touch him. And the presence of God has got to become strong enough in this room. That when people walk into this room, they come into this place, their brokenness can be healed. Scripture says, Mark 6, And when they came out of the boat, immediately people recognized him. Ran through that whole surrounding region and began to carry out beds of those who were sick to whatever they heard, wherever they heard that he was. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, or in the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. Mark 5, going back. A certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years, had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. She said, If only I may touch his clothes, I'll be made well. Immediately the fountain of blood dried up and she left. She felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately, knowing himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who? touched my clothes. But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But this woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Another story. A certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. Oh, by the way, this was at the pool of Bethesda, where the waters were troubled at times, and whoever got in the water first were healed. This man couldn't get in the water. And nobody to help him. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be well? The sick man said, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool. And when the water is stirred up, that while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said, Take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well. Took up his bed and walked. That same day was the Sabbath. Wherever Jesus was at, he healed her broken. Just through his touch. I don't know if. This may be too old, old for uh, Edward to know. But there's an old song that says, He touched me. Oh, He touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened. And now, I know he touched me and made me whole. I was shackled 
confess this place confess these people stand your feet would you stay in an attitude of praise and prayer to God worship to God
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, I ask you to touch those watching by means of internet and in this room. Lay your hand upon us. Touch our lives. Prepare us, God. Prepare our hearts to be a nation and a people touched by your hand. You're the answer. Nothing else will. Nothing else will work. Only you. Put our trust in you today, God. Touch every life in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Pray. Hallelujah. information about Victory Church or to browse our media library, find us online at www.victorychurchnwa.com. Thanks be to God who always leads us in victory.